there's a lot of different ways we can label thoracic kyphosis, forward head posture, upper lower cross syndrome, all of these things have a lot of common traits. And they're really just a battle for the body to stay in line. Everything is just a management of gravity. Everything our body is trying to do in terms of posture is a strategy to conserve energy, but also remain upright in a posture that is most efficient for us as individuals, given the context of our previous history, our genetics, our lifestyle, and all these different things. I'm gonna throw up an image right here, and I think it's going to do a really good job of illustrating how all these different postures are just a result of trying to keep an even center of mass down the midline of the body. The normal human spine curve has a degree of extension at the lumbar spine, a degree of flexion or kyphosis at the thoracic spine, and also a little bit of extension at the cervical spine. But what happens when we have a very rounded upper back? And then how does that feed into the rest of our body? That's what we're gonna talk about. If you have a massive increase in one of these three curves right here, it's almost guaranteed that the other curves are going to be affected as a result of that. So let's say, and this is the most common thing that I see, this pelvis is pretty far forward. You get an increase in the extension of the lumbar curve. So what's gonna happen? If we're being pushed forward really far now, the chest is gonna come out like this, that's not gonna be very efficient for managing gravity. That's not gonna be very efficient for finding our whole foot when we walk because we're gonna be pushed onto our toes at all times. What are we gonna do? We're gonna find a way to depress this to bring it back. So if we depress this chest right here, that can allow for an exaggerated spinal curve at both the lumbar and the thoracic region. What that will help us do is it'll help us come back a little bit despite the increase in extension. And now you've got spinal curves that are increased just in an attempt to keep that line going down the midline of the body. And this is me trying to simplify it. There's obviously so many more factors that go into posture, but this is a pretty easy to understand concept just as it relates to increased spinal curves. I know this is a video about thoracic kyphosis, but just to give a full picture, the next step in this progression would be, let's say we have a really rounded back, and let's say that this pelvis is forward, so our chest is being pulled forward, our pelvis is pushing us forward, and now we feel like we're falling too far forward. So what we might wanna do in that case is we might want to grip our glutes, or we can create some compression or muscle tone or tightness, whatever you want to call it, back here, which will then pull the pelvis under us, and now you've got sway back posture. Now you have a situation where this is going down and in and pushing forward, and that kind of slides the pelvis underneath this person, so it looks like they have no glutes whatsoever, but they can still have an exaggerated spinal curve right here, because this is still present but the pelvis is what's helping us feel like, at least subconsciously and within our balance, that we're being a little bit more even and upright. So now we've got a couple of issues that we see all the time. If this rounds forward, there goes that forward head posture. And also, this extension right here is going to lock this back part of the rib cage. So people will often look at this and say, hmm, well, if I'm forward like this, then I got tight pecs, I've got lengthened upper back muscles. So what we need to do is train the upper back to pull this together and then we can get more upright. Yes and no, because that does make sense on the surface and it is a potential part of a solution, but it's also not the full picture because what if we did all the upper back work in the world, but our pelvis was still forward and pushing us forward? then that's going to create a little bit of a limitation no matter how much upper back work we do, no matter how much pec stretching we do, because we're not appreciating how this is driving this. If you look at it from the front view here, if we get this to be pulled down right here, which pulls the head forward, then these ribs are in a depressed state. They're down in what we call internal rotation of the ribs. These ribs up here act differently than these ribs down here. You can see that these ribs down here have leverage to swing outward and upward like this. So when we breathe in, these move a little bit outwards. But up here, we call these the pump handle ribs. 
these ribs are able to expand from front to back. There's not much rotation and swinging outwards because of how they attach on the body and the axial skeleton. So if these pump handle ribs are depressed and pulling down, then we don't have a lot of leverage to, when we breathe in, get this to rise up as it naturally should. When we breathe in, there should be a synchronous rise of the belly and expansion of the rib cage in all directions. But here, that ain't happening. So what we're gonna end up doing is we're gonna be biased towards, in many cases, to kick on the accessory respiratory muscles that attach specifically on the first two ribs right here that will try to elevate the pump handle right here, but that also will cause the neck to come forward because these muscles attach on the anterior rib cage right here. So if this gets tighter right here, this gets pulled forward even more. Now we're feeding the mechanism that's causing us to basically be in this thoracic kyphosis or upper cross syndrome. But the issue is, is that it's more of a breathing thing. It's more of a pelvis position thing than anything else first and foremost. Here's the other thing. A lot of people talk about diaphragmatic breathing and for a good reason, but it's often not fully understood and appreciated in the context of posture. So if this is down, our diaphragm, which is a muscle that needs to be able to, when we inhale, it needs to be able to descend and then ascend upon exhalation. It's going to be stuck in a descended position if this is down forcing it down. So when we inhale, that diaphragm is going to try to descend further. It's not gonna be very good at that. So what you might end up seeing is air follows the path of least resistance. It will expand these ribs down here even more if this is depressed, or it will try to shoot air into our back, which is not a bad thing, but ultimately that's going to be keep feeding this issue of here and then this instead of that. Imagine if you did three sets of 10 of some exercise for your upper back right here, and hopefully you strengthen the muscles to help pull your shoulders back. Or we can first address the breathing pattern. And then if we breathe tens of thousands of times every single day, that's going to allow us to open up this chest as it normally should upon inhalation. The diaphragm won't be stuck, the neck won't be trying to go into overdrive to help us breathe, and this pelvis won't be shoving us forward if we're also addressing this as part of the solution. Then we can start to think about this stuff. So to summarize, there's two steps here that I think should be taken care of first in the vast majority of these cases before we think about doing a bunch of stuff for the upper back because we want to set the upper back in a more neutral position first. If the pelvis is part of this issue driving it forward here, then we want to recruit some muscles that will help control the posterior orientation of that pelvis. We also want to make sure we can drive air into this front rib cage right here, specifically rib seven and above. That's where we're gonna be focusing our efforts here. And there's specific ways we can do that. And to start, we want to have about a 90 degree bend in the knee and also a 45 degree bend at the waist. Now, Kyle, feel your whole foot flat on the floor right there, and then make sure everything is relaxed in your body. Now, if you're unsure how to do a posterior pelvic tilt, you can imagine that there's a bug underneath your low back. Put a little bit of pressure on that bug, squish it just a little bit, and then lift your pelvis off of the ground, pulling back with your heels on the ground here. And that should allow you to engage these back of the thigh, upper hamstring muscles. That's what we're going for here. Now, keeping your hands on your ribs, keep your stomach nice and relaxed. And now let's go up into a bridge. Now that you know how to do that posterior pelvic tilt. So exhale, big open mouth, good. Now pull him back with the heels. He's got his hips off the ground, low back's flat on the ground. Now I want you to keep this position as you inhale through your nose and exhale through your mouth. After you feel like you have good control of that pelvis, I want you to reach low with your palms up. Low meaning about 45 degrees or less relative to his trunk and the floor. And now you should feel a good bit of hamstrings here and your side abs as you exhale. The important thing is to not overly engage your six pack abs. We don't want these abs to be working more than the side abs. So as we exhale with that big open mouth, that allows us to engage the side abs here. While we're feeling the hamstrings, good. He just finished his exhale, and I want you to hold that, hold the tension in your side abs right here as you inhale through your nose. As you do that, you should feel your chest expand with air. That's exactly what we want. So here we're getting expansion of the rib cage, 
we're getting the hamstrings to work to control the pelvis, and he's just passively holding this right, right here. Maybe about three out of 10 intensity of holding this roller. The really nice thing about the exercises that help control the position of the pelvis is that just by breathing through them as I described, you're going to be getting a little bit more expansion in the rib cage as it is because we're just simply improving our overall breathing strategy. But how can we get more specific with driving air into this chest wall right here? Well, imagine that this cylinder right here is a water bottle, that's half full. If there's water in this and I tip it one direction or the other, then gravity is going to influence where that water is going to go. Air is very similar, it follows the path of least resistance. So if I tip a half filled water bottle on its side like this and now it's facing down, then the water is going to go down. That's where the air is going to go. So if I get in a prone position with my chest parallel to the floor, then I'm going to be naturally biasing the expansion of my chest wall. This is all four quadruped breathing with a book underneath one hand. For this, all you really need is about a, oh, that's probably one and a half to two inches thick object, a book works really well, underneath one hand. This is gonna offset you slightly so that you bias more air into one chest wall, then you'll flip after a couple breaths to the other side. So let's get in this quadruped position and you want your hands underneath your shoulders, knees are underneath the hips. That looks really nice. Now, in order to get into this position, we want to just have a slight tuck of the hips right here. Imagine your hips are a bowl of water and spill it out the back just a little bit and then slightly push through your hands to bring these ribs back just a little bit. Great, that's all we really want. Maybe just a little bit more right there. Great, elbows are unlocked. Nice, now. What we're gonna do in this position is keep our weight evenly distributed between our knees and also our hands, 50-50. And then give me a nice open mouth exhale until you feel your side abs engage right here. Once those side abs are engaged, hold on to them as you inhale through your nose and you should feel some expansion happening within your chest and your stomach and rib cage should expand simultaneously, but making sure you're holding on to these side abs throughout the duration of the set. Do five breaths on one side, then switch to the book to the other side and do five breaths on the other. The first and definitely most common mistake we see on this activity is over rounding the spine. This is what we see a lot with quadruped breathing. It's all over the internet, but this is not actually achieving the desired outcome because we're depressing our sternum. The goal is to get air into our chest because we're prone and air follows the path of least resistance to expand the front of our chest. But if we're over rounding, then our sternum gets depressed. Imagine that your sternum right here is like a laser pointer and keep it down at the ground the whole time. So you wanna have a slight amount of retraction like this and your hips are tucked a little bit, but it shouldn't be so much that you're over rounding. The second thing that we see is a locking out excessively of the elbows. When you do this, you're more likely to over round and you're more likely to create too much tension within your pecs during this. We want the pecs to be totally relaxed. And the last thing that we see is pushing the head forward excessively. This is an attempt usually to breathe through the neck as opposed to the diaphragm. So what we wanna do here is whatever position you can talk the easiest in is a really good cue for good neck positioning. So if you can talk in a nice neutral head posture, that's probably where you want to be. This is the rock back lat stretch with cervical rotation. The purpose of this activity is to decompress and get the tone out of the lat muscle, which is a huge muscle that runs throughout your back and attaches on your arm and upper back. And if this muscle is too tight, it's going to end up compressing that back rib cage, restricting our movement and breathing mechanics. And the same side rotation of the neck also helps move the vertebrae out of the way on that side to create length there as well that runs all the way down to the base of our neck. So what we want to do to set up for this activity is get in this sort of child's pose position like this. 
Rock your hips back in a comfortable manner, and then slightly push into the ground with our forearms. You don't want to do it too much, just a little bit. And then take one elbow, keep the palm up towards you, scoot it a comfortable distance away, but not pushing too much. Your hips can come forward slightly, press into the ground with that elbow about a three out of 10 intensity. And then turn your head to the same side, drop that shoulder out of your ear and rock back. You should feel that stretch running through here into your armpit. And then keep that as you inhale through your nose, try to drop that shoulder more when you inhale. Exhale. I also like to use objective tests to determine if we're actually getting the intended outcome. So one way we can test that is through shoulder internal rotation. Imagine what I talked about earlier about how these ribs tend to get depressed and pulled down like this. That's gonna round the shoulders forward, right? That's going to bias this humerus right here into an already internally rotated position. The pecs are tight, compressing the front of the rib cage. But if we could get that expansion there and the shoulders weren't pulled forward, then we would have better internal rotation. This is how you measure that. To properly assess shoulder internal rotation, make sure you lay flat on the ground or a table with your feet up and your low back flat. Keep your elbow perfectly in line with the level of your shoulder and keep your wrist nice and straight. Go down until you feel a restriction in your shoulder or you feel like your shoulder is about to come off of the ground. I'm referring to the back part of your shoulder when I say that. Right there is an example of me pushing my shoulder too far forward in an attempt to find more range of motion. We also want to make sure that we're not starting with our elbow too far low, which will help us find that range of motion easily, but it's not a genuine assessment. Same thing with the elbow too far high. If you had less than 70 degrees of internal rotation of the shoulder, chances are you got some tightness right here. And you can imagine this on yourself. If this is pulled down, shoulders are forward, punch your shoulder forward like this, bring your elbow up and then try to internally rotate. It feels terrible. Now roll your shoulders back a little bit, not too much, but get them in a more neutral position and then try it. It feels so much easier because we're not pushing the humerus and the rib cage into a position that it basically is stuck in. We can't get somewhere we're trying to go if we're already there. So if this is rounded forward and this is already internally rotated, everything's biased towards internal rotation. It's gonna be hard to achieve more internal rotation through a measurement, which is why it's important to start in a neutral position. And now if we can do that, we're not stuck here and these muscles on the upper back are all lengthened out, then we can get this to come up a little bit and now these upper back muscles are in a better position to be recruited for when we do those exercises.